So this is going to be a short video on the drug erythromycin, which is a macrolide antibiotic. Now it's not a drug that I get to prescribe that often because I work in hospital medicine and in the UK we don't use erythromycin that much in hospitals. It's much more an antibiotic that is used in primary care and it's two main indications that it's prescribed for are both skin conditions, chronic skin conditions, namely acne and rosacea. So the normal dose of erythromycin is 500 milligrams twice a day and it normally comes in tablets that contain 250 milligrams of the drug and therefore people normally end up taking two tablets twice a day whilst they're on it. Now we've discussed how the main indications are chronic skin conditions. Therefore when this drug is prescribed to treat those chronic skin conditions, people can end up taking it for a very long period of time. So it can really be prescribed for months to years. It is therefore a very safe and well-tolerated antibiotic. The main side effect that most people may experience with it is epigastric pain. Epigastric pain is a wonderful term in medicine. It means pain in the vicinity of the stomach, that's what epi means, around gastric means stomach, so around the stomach, that is caused by the acidity of the stomach being too much, so the pH being too low. So hopefully you're aware that the stomach produces acid to help digest the food. If the pH of the stomach becomes too low, i.e. it becomes too acidic, then this can cause problems with the stomach and the portions of the GI tract that are around the stomach. So it can actually burn the wall of the stomach and lead to pain. It can also burn the wall of the lower part of the esophagus that neighbours the stomach and which gets uh, acid coming back up it. And it can also burn the wall of the duodenum, which is the part of the GI tract that follows on from the stomach. So again, if the acidity is too much, it can affect these neighbouring parts of the GI tract and lead to pain in these regions. So pain from the stomach or from the first part of the duodenum would be felt in the upper part of the tummy. Pain from the lower portion of the esophagus is often felt in the uh, lower part of the chest and is often referred to as reflux. But we can refer to all of these types of pain that are due to stomach acid problems as epigastric pain. Another term that you might see used is dyspepsia. So pepsia refers to acid and dys means problems with the acid. So these are brilliant terms that we often use in medicine. So many antibiotics can lead to epigastric pain or dyspepsia and the reason is that the stomach has commensals that live in it. So there are bacteria that colonize the surface of the stomach and are adapted to live in that environment. And the way that they are able to survive in the acidic environment of the stomach is that they produce neutralizing substances which neutralize the acid and reduce its acidity, i.e. they raise the pH. And that allows them to live happily on the surface of the stomach. And they don't cause any problems there, they're normal. Everyone has these. Now, when you take antibiotics, certain antibiotics will hit these bacteria and kill them. And when they are eradicated from the surface of the stomach, suddenly you lose their presence and you lose all the neutralizing molecules that they usually produce. And that means that the stomach's still producing the same amount of acid, but now you don't have that neutralizing effect from these bacteria. And therefore, it becomes more acidic, the stomach, and the pH becomes lower, and then you can get it causing burning of the stomach wall and burning of the lower portion of the esophagus and burning of the first part of the duodenum, i.e. you can get epigastric pain. So many antibiotics cause this and it's because those antibiotics are the ones that are capable of killing these bacteria that live on the surface of the stomach. And unfortunately macrolides and erythromycin in particular are dreadful for causing this. So they're very good at killing these bacteria and therefore they do have a nasty habit of leading to epigastric pain. For this reason, it is advised that when you take your erythromycin tablets, that you take them with food. So usually it's being taken twice a day, so in the morning and the evening. So we suggest that you take them with breakfast and your evening meal. Uh, and this helps because the food is going to help neutralize the acid. Uh, and therefore, at the time when the antibiotic's presence is strongest, you're going to be having that neutralizing effect on the acid because if you take the antibiotic without food, it's going to go down to the stomach, kill all the bacteria, and then you're going to get this uh, surge in acidity in the stomach. 
So at that same time as you're taking the antibiotic, you want to be taking it with food to try and neutralize the acid and reduce the epigastric pain that you're going to experience. And usually if people do follow that advice and take the antibiotic with food, usually they can avoid this side effect. Whereas if they take it on an empty stomach or if God forbid they're doing some fad diet where they're not eating anything for an entire day and they continue to take the antibiotic, they will get very, very bad epigastric pain or indigestion is the other term that you could use as well as dyspepsia. So that is often the only side effect that people taking this antibiotic will experience. Interestingly, uh, a side effect that is very common for other antibiotics, which is diarrhea, is not a big problem for erythromycin. So the reason that many antibiotics cause diarrhea is that not only is the stomach uh, colonized by commensors, but other portions of the GI tract are as well. In particular, the colon has a huge number of different bugs that live quite happily and quite peacefully on the surface of it. And when you take antibiotics, if those antibiotics kill those commensals in the colon, it can massively irritate the colon. Indeed, it responds to this change in the microbiome on its surface the way it would respond to an infection. So, for instance, if you catch a virus that infects the GI tract, viral gastroenteritis, the way the GI tract responds to it is it massively increases motility to try and empty all contents from it because it sees the contents as being laden with the infectious pathogen, so the virus in this case. And therefore, if it can empty, evacuate all the contents, then hopefully this will help clear the infection. So the colon often responds to infection by increasing motility, all the contents, all the, um, all the stuff within the lumen, all the fecal contents is going to be moved much quicker through the colon. There's going to be less time for water absorption uh, and therefore it comes out very liquidy uh, and you get diarrhea. So that's part of the colon's response to infection. Now unfortunately when you take antibiotics that disturb the microbiome of the colon, this change in the bacteria that live on the surface of the colon, the colon senses that and responds to it often in the same way as it would respond to being infected by, let's say, a virus. So it increases motility, all the contents is moved through much quicker, no water is absorbed, and you get diarrhea. So a lot of antibiotics therefore lead to diarrhea. However, macrolide antibiotics and erythromycin, the one we're talking about, they're generally not that bad for causing this, so they don't usually hit the uh, lower parts of the GI tract commensals too badly and therefore you don't usually get diarrhea on these antibiotics. You can do, but it's not a massive problem for macrolides, whereas other antibiotics, uh, it is a much bigger problem. So penicillins, for instance, it's usually a much bigger problem. So the other side effect that you need to be aware of as a prescriber, it's not so much important for the patients to understand this, but it's very important for prescribers to understand this when prescribing macrolide antibiotics, is that they inhibit an enzyme called CYP, C-Y-P, 3A4. So the liver is an incredibly important organ for breaking down, metabolizing drugs that we give to people to take. Uh, and the enzymes, there is a whole class of enzymes in the liver called the CYP enzymes, the CYP enzymes. Uh, and one of these is called CYP3A4. And this enzyme is very important for breaking down a huge number of drugs that are used clinically, in particular, simvastatin and or indeed many statins, including in particular simvastatin and also warfarin are examples of drugs that are broken down by this enzyme. So I've written the names of those drugs down here. So statins, many statins are broken down by this enzyme. Not all of them, however, but one in particular to be aware of is simvastatin. So just in case you're watching this video and you don't know what statins are, they are drugs used to lower cholesterol. And as cholesterol is a massive risk factor for atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease, therefore, we often give statins to older people to lower their cardiovascular risk. Now, the problem is these drugs, many of these drugs, including this one in particular, are broken down by this enzyme CYP3A4. And by the way, not all statins are broken down by this. I think rosuvastatin is an example of one that isn't broken down by this enzyme and which therefore doesn't interact with macrolides. However, this one is terrible for its interaction with macrolides. So simvastatin is broken down by this enzyme and therefore if you give a drug that inhibits this enzyme, which macrolide antibiotics do and erythromycin, the one we're talking about, does, 
um, that means that this enzyme no longer has the same level of function as before you took the drug and therefore this drug, this other drug that you might be taking at the same time, let's say someone is taking simvastatin and erythromycin, if they were to do that, then the simvastatin wouldn't get broken down properly by this enzyme anymore and would accumulate in the blood and it can then lead to horrible side effects. The main side effect of statins is that they are myotoxic. They are, can cause massive problems for the muscle tissue of your body. So your biceps muscle, your quadriceps muscle, all of these muscle tissues, it, the, this drug can poison them if it gets to high enough levels. It can cause them to die, the muscle cells to die, uh, a phenomenon called rhabdomyolysis, and that's very dangerous. So it's therefore very important that someone shouldn't be taking statins and drugs that inhibit this enzyme. So you shouldn't prescribe erythromycin to someone who is on a statin which is broken down by this enzyme. Now that's usually not going to be a major problem because as we've said, the main reason this drug is prescribed in the UK is for acne and rosacea. Acne is a skin condition generally of the young, so very few of the people taking erythromycin are actually going to be on a statin. However, rosacea is a condition that can affect older people as well, and therefore if an individual is being prescribed erythromycin for rosacea and they're older and they're on a statin, or indeed if they're on other medicines, you should carefully look at those other medicines and make sure that they are not broken down by the CYP3A4 enzyme and therefore their breakdown isn't going to be affected by this drug and they're not going to accumulate in the body. Another example is the drug warfarin, another very famous drug. This drug works to thin the blood. It, if you take warfarin, it means that your blood takes longer to clot. Um, and the reason that we give this to people is if they are at high risk of forming blood clots inside their blood vessels for one reason or another that can lead to massive problems, we give them this drug warfarin to stop those blood clots from forming. Now again, this drug is broken down by this enzyme CYP3A4 and a bunch of other CYP enzymes within the liver. However, if someone is on warfarin and they take a macrolide antibiotic such as erythromycin, this drug's level will accumulate and the effect of it will massively be increased. So you will potentially thin their blood much more than you would like and it will take even longer for their blood to clot and that is potentially going to become very dangerous. So the overall message here is that Erythromycin and indeed other macrolide antibiotics are very potent inhibitors of this enzyme CYP3A4, a liver enzyme that is important in breaking down many drugs. So if the person that you are prescribing the macrolide antibiotic to is on other medicines, you need to look up whether those medicines are broken down by the CYP3A4 enzyme and therefore are they going to have potentially a very dangerous interaction with this antibiotic. And as I say, this antibiotic is often prescribed to young people and therefore it's not an issue because they're often on no other medicines. However, its brother, chlorophromycin, another macrolide antibiotic, is prescribed for many other indications such as chest infections, skin infections, and we commonly prescribe that in hospital to treat said infections. And this may be being prescribed to elder people who are on a huge number of different medicines and in that case it is very important to look at their other medicines and make sure that there isn't a potentially dangerous interaction. And the classic one is simvastatin. You must stop simvastatin if someone is being placed on a macrolide antibiotic.